the previous video, we identified the three main components of backup. In this video, we'll be focusing mostly on vamping, though we'll throw in a few licks and just enough music theory to keep things interesting. Many of you are no doubt familiar with these three chord shapes. These are commonly referred to as the F shape, D shape, and bar shape. A less banjo-centric nomenclature for the same positions is root, first inversion, and second inversion. It doesn't really matter what you call them, but it will be helpful to understand how they're related. In the previous video, we learned that a major chord is built using the first, third, and fifth degrees of the major scale. In the key of G, that's G, B, and D. If we were to stack the notes in this order, with the G as the lowest bass note, this is called the root position chord. If we were to invert the chord by moving the G up one octave to the top of the stack, leaving the B in the bass, this is known as the first inversion of a G chord. Repeat the process and you get the second inversion. These are all still G chords regardless of how the notes are stacked. And if we add the first string to fill out the chords, there you have it, the three fundamental major chord shapes on the banjo. Incidentally, the first string is just repeating the notes played on the fourth string, but one octave higher. These three shapes are the cornerstone of playing chords on the banjo. Not only are they the shapes you'll be vamping with, but their geometry hold the key to all those fancy licks you hear Earl play. Being able to visualize these shapes or patterns is key to demystifying the banjo neck. So when you play this, you should be seeing or thinking this. There are three fundamental chord types. Major, minor, and dominant. Sure, there are a slew of other chord variations, but harmonically speaking, they all typically function as one of these three types. Major chords have a happy sound, minor chords are kind of sad, and dominant chords are tense, meaning they sound unresolved. We'll be going into more detail in future videos regarding chords, but for now, let's take a look at minor and dominant seventh chords. To build a minor chord, we use the one, three, and five just like the major chord, but with one exception we flat the third, which means you move the third down one half step or one fret. In the key of G, the third is B, so move it down one fret and you get a B flat. The notes of a G minor chord are G, B flat, and D. Here are what the three basic shapes look like when you flat the third. Building a dominant seventh or a seventh chord requires two steps. A seventh chord is a major chord or triad with a flatted seventh added to the top of the note stack. So step one, find the seventh degree of the major scale. In the key of G, that's F sharp. Step two, flat the F sharp by dropping it down a half step or one fret to get F. If we added F sharp instead of F natural, that would make a major seventh chord. If the chord symbol doesn't specifically mention major seven, then you always play a dominant seventh. As you can hear, there's a big difference between these two chords. A major seventh chord is about as happy and carefree as a chord can get. In fact, the major seventh chord is partly responsible for all those middle of the road radio hits from the early seventies. Gentle on my mind is about as close as the major seventh chord gets to bluegrass. Whereas the dominant seven chord shows up all the time. Something interesting happens when we turn these three shapes into seventh chords. First off, they're more difficult to play, but more importantly, now that we have four notes in the chord instead of three, we get a third inversion. Due to the tuning and limited number of strings on the banjo, we don't get all four notes in each of these shapes, so we just do the best we can. If the fingering for some of these positions is working you over, don't sweat it too hard. It's more important to see the geometry and understand what's going on than it is to be able to fret the perfect G7 first inversion. Okay, one last bit of theory before we get on with the vamping. There's really no end to vamping variations, but they all start right here. Common time and waltz time. If you look at the staff, you'll see a fraction. This tells us the time signature we're in. 4-4 is referred to as common time and can be marked with either a 4-4 or a C for common. 3-4 is often referred to as waltz time. We'll be focusing mostly on common time in this video, so let's get on with the vamping. Here's vamping variation number one, which we covered in the previous video. Variation number two is the same exact picking pattern, 
but we jump between the root and the first inversion. To avoid boredom while practicing these patterns, I recommend running them up and down the neck, either chromatically or diatonically. Walking up and down the neck chromatically means you move one fret at a time in either direction. To do it diatonically means you'll stick to the notes of the major scale or whatever key you happen to be playing in. Practicing this way commits you to running a certain amount of repetitions and works your fretting hand at the same time. After you get comfortable with the patterns, then it's time to apply them to chord progressions. Here's an exercise to practice vamping variations number one and two. Here are two more common variations. In this exercise, we'll use these two variations and throw in some seventh chords to spice things up. A big part of playing music is finding creative ways to get from point A to point B. In this exercise, we'll be adding some bass runs to walk between the chords. These are often called passing tones. In this exercise, we'll apply passing tones to the chord progression from Don't Let Your Deal Go Down. When playing at fast tempos, you may find the previous vamping patterns too cumbersome. If that be the case, then you can always leave some notes out. In variation number five, we won't pick the third string, but we'll still fret the chords as usual. In the next two exercises, we're going to add a little syncopation to our passing tones. Syncopation is just a fancy word for accenting the beat in an unexpected way. Now let's try some shuffle patterns, or boogie woogie as Earl called it. Variation number six is often referred to as the six white horses lick, since that song makes great use of this pattern. There are several different ways to play this variation, but this is my personal favorite. Variation number seven uses syncopation to achieve a swinging sound. In this exercise, we'll use both variations. Now I'll add a slide to create a punchy swinging feel. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in this video, and as you can see, there's really no ending to vamping variations. So to close out this lesson, here's a handful more. If you would like the PDF and table edit files that accompany this video, they're available through SeanRay.com. And if you'd like to be notified when new videos are released, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.